Loop 8 Summer of Gods has been called the worst JRPG by many people. It has absolutely horrible reviews. Now I am a huge JRPG fan. They're probably my favorite type of video game. So when I first heard about Loop 8, I was really curious as to why it got so much hate. What makes a bad JRPG? The game is about a silent protagonist moving to a new town, discovering he has crazy powers, and using them to save the world with all of his new friends. That sounds like the premise to a Persona game, and I love Persona. So what went wrong here? Well, I have now been through the entirety of Loop 8, and I figured it out. I know what went wrong. This game is a hot mess from start to finish. Trust me, it's bad. But is it the worst JRPG of all time, like so many others have said? Well, why don't I tell you all about Loop 8, and we can figure that out together. So let's just get started and jump into the story, because it sure is something. Despite seeing all of the endings and most of the conversations with every character, I still have no clue what's happening in this game. I feel like I'm missing something huge, but I'm not. The game is just awful at storytelling. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, you play as the silent protagonist, Nini. So there are these evil beings that live in the underworld called Kegai, and they keep showing up and wreaking havoc on the planet. Due to so many Kegai attacking the Earth, a group of people fled the planet to live on a space station. Nini's family was a part of this group. One day, there was a horrible incident. They don't ever explicitly say what the incident was, but it was bad. We're just gonna have to take the game's word for it. Everyone on the space station died, except for Nini. So he comes down to Earth to live in a quiet town called Ashihara, which has been mostly unaffected by the Kegai. On August 1st, he arrives, and waiting for him is Konoha. I saw her standing before me. I knew at once that my summer had begun. Now with an introduction like that, my first thought was, oh, she must be the canon love interest. Turns out we're cousins. First cousins once removed. Okay, never mind. I was wrong. She's your cousin. She can't be the canon love interest. Right? Konoha shows us our new home and gives us a lot of random facts that have no effect on the story. The other homes in Ashihara may look ancient, but I bet they're only around 50 years old. Houses in Japan are normally rebuilt every two or three decades. Even with our old shrines, we often rebuild them as well. Now we head to our first day of school and the teacher announces that there will be a new student. Today our class grows by one, for we have a new transfer student. Please make her feel at home here. Introduce yourself. I lack a surname for reasons of my own. Ichika is what I'm called. Wait, what? Who's that? I'm a new student too. Why don't I get an introduction? Then this fox girl named Benny jumps up in front of everyone and is like, ah, K guy are coming. And everyone is like, yeah, okay, Benny, whatever. You're always like this. The next day, a portal opens up at the shrine. The game says that Nini just somehow senses this, so he goes over there. Benny and Ichika have already arrived and start spouting a bunch of nonsense at Nini about his demon sense power and how the three of them can stop the K-Guy. Nini questions none of this, and the three go into the portal and enter Yumotsu Hirasaka, which is basically Ajihara's version of the other world from Silent Hill. They find this big monster in there, which one-shots them, and they all die. Nini then wakes up, and it's August 1st again. The first loop of the game has begun. Yeah, so the reason the game is called Loop 8 is because it's about time looping, and it takes place during August, the eighth month of the year. Okay, so the opening of the game is a little shaky, but it's not the worst. But from this point is where the game starts to really go downhill. Now seems like a good time to talk about the gameplay. So Loop 8 is about 97% spamming through dialogue and 3% battling. Yeah, not a good ratio for a JRPG. You will play through five day increments until the end of the month. During those days, a character will become possessed by a K-Guy and you have to figure out who it is. Once you do, you can enter Yumotsu Hirasaka, where you can fight the possessed character. However, before you do that, you're going to want to spend a lot of time talking to all of your friends and doing various activities to raise your stats so you don't get demolished in the boss fight. Time is constantly ticking in the game, with every 60 seconds making an hour pass, giving you limited time to raise your stats. If you die, or if the five days are up without you stopping the K-Guy, or figuring out who is possessed, it will be a game over and you start a new loop by going all the way back to the beginning of August and playing through the game again. Alright, now that you've got a gist of the gameplay, let me tell you why it's so dreadful. Let's start with the thing you'll be doing the most in this game, talking to characters. So relationships are pretty important in Loop 8, 
The more your party members like you and each other, the stronger you are. Similarly, if you have a good relationship with a possessed character, their boss fight is going to be a lot easier. So you have to spend a lot of time trying to get on everyone's good side. Now, this is the perfect opportunity for the game to give you some really intriguing dialogue and development for each character to make you care about them. Too bad Loop 8 doesn't have any of that. Bonding with the characters consists of picking one of these options, such as get to know better, flatter, or tease. If they're happy with what you picked, they'll reply with a thanks. And that's it. Your bond has been raised. Yes. Now go do this a million more times with all of the other characters. Sometimes when you talk to them, they'll tell you a little bit more about themselves or Ashihara, but it's just a few lines of dialogue that you can't even reply to because we're a silent protagonist. Once you've raised your bond enough with a character, you'll unlock 60 second scenes that teleport you across the town where you get to learn a little bit more about them. I remember the past quite clearly. Ah, but if you're talking about my human years, I don't recall as much. Only your face. Well, isn't that fascinating? Now, whether or not you can raise affection with a character is based on their mood. If they're in a bad mood, they're going to get really mad about you trying to get to know them. So naturally, you just wait to talk to them until they're in a good mood, right? Well, that doesn't always work either. Despite the fact that the game will tell you a character is in a good mood, sometimes they'll still decide that they just hate you right now and will be pissed off by anything you say, making their affection go down. And other times, their mood will change in the short time it took you to walk up to them, and now they're going to be angry no matter what you do. Why are you so mad about me flattering you? You can also spend your time doing various activities around the town by yourself or with others to raise your stats like strength and agility. But of course, it just kind of says that you did it. You don't get to see any of it happen. That'd be too entertaining. As I mentioned before, anytime that you die or fail to stop the possessed character, the game loops. No one, except for probably Konoha, remembers the previous loops, Nini included. Narratively, that's pretty dumb, because what is even the point of looping if it has no effect on the story? But from a gameplay standpoint, it is awful. Since no one remembers anything, all of your stats and relationships reset with every loop, meaning every time you have to go through all of the same dialogue with every character. The game makes it so their affection will rise quicker with each loop, but that doesn't change the fact that you have to spam through the same lines over and over again with every loop just to get back to where you were before so you can occasionally see some new dialogue. It's so tedious and annoying, you're just asking your players to get frustrated and quit. There had to be a better way to do this. The last thing a player wants to do after spending hours in the game and nearly making it to the end is go through the same dialogue with no skip option for the billionth time. Okay, let's move on to the whole Kegai possession element. The Gete Himotsu Hirasaka won't open until you've figured out which character is possessed, which can be really difficult. The game will give you vague hints that aren't really helpful at all, like this one where it mentions the possessed character having issues with her parents. Naturally, I'm going to assume it's referring to the little girl or even one of the other students. But no, it was referring to Nini's teacher. How was I supposed to know that you have problems with your parents? The game will also show you a location the possessed person will show up in, but that's not really helpful either. All of the characters go to every location in the town. It could be anyone. Not only that, but sometimes you have to talk to a character several times at that location before the cutscene confirming their possess even happens. I have seen so many people say that they got a game over and had to start a new loop because they couldn't figure out who was possessed due to how hard it is. And on each loop, the order of the possessed characters changes. So it's not like you can go, oh, it was Michi first last time, so it will be again. It'll be someone else this time. But okay, let's say you figured out who's possessed. It's now time to head to Yumotsu Hirasaka, and you need some party members to go with you. The game leads you to believe that you can choose anyone to take with you, but that's not true. There are only a handful of characters who can fight, and you're not told who they are. All of them will join your party, but if you've picked one of the characters who can't fight, the second you go near the entrance to Yumotsu Hirasaka, they get scared and run away. If I can't use them, why did you let them join my party in the first place? Inside Yumotsu Hirasaka, which is just Ashihara with a purple filter on it, you can encounter enemies and enter into a battle like most dungeons in an RPG. However, in Loop 8, these battles are pointless. There are no levels in the game, so there isn't any experience to gain. All you really get is a bit of a boost to your relationships, but not enough to make these fights worth it. It's really not going to make you any stronger for the boss. And the battle system itself is weird. The strength of your attack is based on feelings? Like, you have to select if you want to attack with friendship, affection, or hate. Hate is the strongest, but it also makes the enemy stronger. It's a pretty confusing system, and I can't even notice much of a difference between friendship and hate. You also have no control over your party members. They do whatever they want, which is kind of annoying. However, Nini has a special power called Demon Sight, 
which allows him to see what actions his party members and the enemy are going to take next. This would be super useful if it weren't for the fact that instead of telling you which attack they're going to do next, it tells you the voice line they're going to say. What does I'm just furious mean? Yeah, so you beat the possessed character, decide if you want to save them or kill them, and then you repeat the whole process over and over again until the end of the month. Okay, so now that you have an idea of Loop 8's gameplay, let's get back to its wonderful story. Or lack thereof. There isn't a whole lot from here on out. Nini doesn't really question anything that's going on around him, like his demon side ability, what Yumotsu Hirosaka is, why the Keigai keep possessing people, and he can't question any of the loops because he doesn't remember them. Actually, none of the characters in the game question what's happening. Not even your party members who can go to Yumotsu Hirosaka with you. They all just kind of accept that it's a thing. Speaking of the characters, let me introduce you to all of them. So we've already met Konoha. She's your cousin who tells you about the town and encourages you to make friends. She's also in love with Nini. At some point, she'll ask you if you're dating, and the game does not give you the option to say no. You have to agree. Congratulations, you are now dating your cousin. There are other dateable characters in the game, and you're given the option to reject them, not Konoha. It doesn't matter if she's your cousin and you're already in a relationship with someone else. She will be your girlfriend. Okay, so next there's this fox girl, Benny. She's apparently a god and will just lore dump on you all the time, but she gives you this lore in small chunks and at the most random times, so it doesn't really help you piece anything together. There's Ichika, who is a god slayer. She says that when she fulfills her role as a god slayer, which will be in about three weeks, she'll die. We're going to ignore the fact that this game goes on for longer than three weeks and she's still there at the end. Also, I think a god slayer is someone who has a god inside of them and they use that power to kill Kagai? I don't really know though. Like everything else, you get this information in short snippets after spamming the get to know me button a billion times. Moving on, there's Saru, who is your bro, Nanachi, the otaku, your teacher, Ms. Kuni, and Takako, a little girl who views Nini as an older brother. Then there's Hori, a fellow student who for like half the game insists that in a past life, Nini and Ichika were his parents. Then one day you talk to him and he's like, I was possessed by the god that was your son this whole time and he just left. So that means you're really not my dad. I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, I don't know. Next is Max and Makina. Max is a teacher at your school who lost his family in a Kagai attack. So he created a robot that resembles his sister that being Makina, and treats her as his daughter. That sounds like it would be really interesting if it were handled right, but like everything else in Loop 8, it's not. Max mentions that he has a daughter when you first meet him, and Makina talks about her dad all the time, but they never say that it's the other person. Like Max never says that his daughter is Makina, and Makina never says that her dad is Max. I didn't figure out their relationship until after the fourth boss fight after accidentally getting Max killed. That's when Makina expresses that she's sad about her dad dying, but then she just forgets that he died for the rest of the game and will say stuff like, my dad gave me some new upgrades. No, he didn't Makina. He's dead. So like I mentioned, Makina is actually a robot. There's no big reveal for this. She just kind of mentions it in conversation and you're like, oh, okay. But sometimes she'll act like she hasn't told you and will say stuff like, I have a big secret. Will you think of me differently if I told you? Makina, I already know your secret. You're a robot. You told me. Then there's Tarasu. If you talk to her, there's an option where she can force a loop if you just want to start over. I have no idea why she has this ability. It's never elaborated on. As Nini talks to her, she'll hint that he looks like someone she used to know. Eventually, she reveals that she's actually Nini's grandma. What? So apparently, Nini's grandpa went to space with their kid two years ago, but I guess time passes quicker there? So everyone ages faster, which is how it's possible for Tarasu to have a 16-year-old grandson at her age. All right, sure. Why not? The last character is Michi, who is just your average gloomy classmate character. Yeah, so once you raise Michi's affection level high enough, every time you talk to her, there's about a 50-50 chance that she'll kill you. Jeez, that's what I get for being nice to people. So everything that I told you about the characters is pretty much the only story you're getting until the end of the game. And like I said, you're only getting that by spamming through these options until you finally get some dialogue other than 
Thank you. You can learn a little bit of extra information about the characters who get possessed. So Kegai will only go after people who are feeling sad. That's right. You better be happy all the time or a Kegai is going to show up and possess you. In Yumoto Hirosaka, you can talk to these little purple dudes, who I think are also Kegai, and they'll give you some insight as to why the possessed character is upset. But it's so vague that it's really no help. Like, when Michi is possessed, you learn that there are a bunch of people who never stood up for her, so I guess she was bullied? And if you thought you'd learn more after their boss fights, you'd be wrong. There's no more information given. They don't even remember that they were possessed. So you spend many hours talking to the characters about practically nothing and occasionally fighting the K-Guy. At the end of every boss fight, you're given the option to either save the possessed character or kill them. Obviously, killing them will lead you to the bad end, while saving everyone will give you two other ending options. Let's start discussing these endings, because they are insane. So no matter what, the last character to get possessed is Konoha. When you get to Yumotsu Hirasaka, she tells you that she's going to destroy the world, and it's Nini's fault because he's going to pick the wrong person again. She's going to kill him and turn him into a K-Guy so they can be together forever because she loves him so much. I barely understand what any of that means, so don't worry if you don't. She turns into a big scary K-Guy and you have to fight her. Once you beat her, you're given three options. Wish for Konoha to survive, wish for the world to survive, and resist fate. As you may have guessed, the true ending is resist fate. In this end, Nini says that he knows how to fix everything, and then it just shows this red string, and it splits in half. This somehow saves both the world and Konoha. There are no more loops or Kegai, and Nini and Konoha live happily ever after together. And then there's this epilogue where Konoha talks about how happy and love she and Nini are. I want to keep Nini all to myself, so that's what I intend to do. Why is the true ending the one where you date your cousin? Alright, how about we wish for Konoha to survive instead? In this ending, the world ends up destroyed by Kegai, but you save Konoha and you're dating her again. Why? Stop that! Okay, final ending. Wish for the world to survive. This time around, the world is saved from the Kegai, but Konoha dies and Nini is so depressed. There are a bunch of shots of him standing around looking sad while he says that his life is nothing without her. Ashihara reminds him of Konoha too much, so he leaves. So that was the bad ending. The only ending where you don't date your cousin is the bad ending. Your three options are to date your cousin, date your cousin, or go into depression because you can't date your cousin. Remember, you can date other girls in this game. Why is Konoha more important than them? Nini isn't this depressed if the other girls or his friends die, but Konoha? Oh, it is the end of the world if he can't date his cousin. Okay, putting that aside, if we can. <laughs> I have no idea what any of these endings mean. What was Konoha talking about before the fight? Why is she a big bad evil being? What is this random string and why does splitting it save both the world and Konoha? Unfortunately, I don't have any answers for you. Loop 8 gives up on giving you any story for the entire middle of the game and expects you to figure things out from the random and vague things the characters tell you after pressing the get to know button 50 times. To no one's surprise, this is not an effective method of storytelling. So if you feel like after all of that, you still don't really know what the plot of Loop 8 is and what the story behind all the characters are, that's exactly how I feel and I've been through the entire game. So since I'm unable to wrap up this story for you, I guess that does it for Loop 8 Summer of Gods. And now it is time to answer the question. Is it the worst JRPG? This might shock you, but I'm going to say no. Look, is it a good game? Absolutely not. The looping system is horrible. Most of the gameplay is spamming through dialogue options. Battles are pointless. It's impossible to find out who is possessed. The story is non-existent. And you have to date your cousin in order to save the world. Now, all that being said, I do think there are some okay things about it. I don't think the game looks too bad. I like the vibe of Ashihara. The concept of the game is cool, even if it was executed poorly. And even though most of the characters have one personality traits and trying to get to know them is like pulling teeth, I did find myself caring about some of them. I liked my best friend Saru. I thought the relationship between Max and Makina was interesting, even though it took me forever to figure out they knew each other. I want to know more about Ichika being a god slayer. Will I ever get more information? No. Do any of these characters have proper development or a story to follow? No. But. I don't hate them. I would like to know more about them. Overall, there are some good ideas here. Loop 8 Summer of Gods is not good, but there was potential and it could have been something great. For a game to be the worst JRPG, I don't think it would have any of that. I'm convinced that there's a worse game out there 
And at this point, I'm kind of determined to find it. So if you think that you know what the worst JRPG is, let me know in the comments below and I will make a video on it. But for now, that is going to do it for me and Loop8. If you liked the video, like and subscribe to see more content from me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!